Hi, this is uh, Matthew Robert Bain. This is a, a T-shirt that I designed of Design 200. You can do something miraculous. You can imagine uh, standing and prophesying over someone with this uh, T-shirt on, uh, saying you can do something miraculous. Okay, so... Uh, I thought uh, in this series, if you're following the series, I thought it might be nice to hear a few testimonies and the gifts of the Holy Spirit that were used in each of the testimonies. So I've been prophesying for about 25 years. I'd say these were round about... Um, Oh, almost uh, 27 years ago. Well, I've got 25 years, but it's probably 27 years ago. Um, but uh, uh, interesting enough, I want to share with you, much to some Pentecostals and Charismatics and disdain, that uh, I was prophesying and moving in the gifts of prophecy as a Baptist boy before I was officially... Uh, baptised in the Holy Spirit. And so that may be uh, controversial to some people, but uh, this is what I was doing. And uh, So I just want to share, uh, take some time. It's 1-1-1 in the morning. 1-11 a.m. in the morning, which is a good number. It's just crossed over to one one twelve. Uh So 27 years ago, I was uh, prophesying and uh, I've been doing it for a long time. In my taxi, I drove a taxi, a, a cab, uh, in Brisbane, Australia, and uh, worked uh, five days a week, did 12-hour shifts. Picked up an average of 20 people a day. And some days I was more anointed and in the flow. Some days... I wasn't, and uh, I didn't even know what the anointing was in those days. But some days I was feeling happier and uh, more creative. I used to read uh, two fiction books a week and one non-fiction book a week while I was waiting in taxi lines. I used to love uh, talking to people. I've always loved engaging people, and driving taxis was my absolute favourite job uh, because sometimes... They're in your taxi for 45 minutes and you can get a good conversation going. In fact, when they get in your taxi, you know how long it's going to take. Uh, they, they say a certain suburb and you know that's going to be 20 minutes or you know that's going to be uh, 45 minutes. And so you have an idea of how to gauge your conversation if you're going to lead somewhere. <laughs> so, um, so 27 years ago, I was in this uh, taxi uh, bringing uh, a person from the city uh, uh, in the afternoon to his home. Uh, he must have wanted to catch a train or a bus and uh, probably didn't have a car, but he drove to the city. A lot of people don't drive to the city. So he jumped in, I was talking, and uh, I said, um, uh, uh, Jesus told me that his brother was dying of cancer, and I said, um, his younger brother, and I said, um, have you heard... Uh, from your younger brother lately. And uh, he said, my younger brother is dead to me. And I said, uh, it's interesting that you use those mafia-like terms that I've heard on TV because your younger brother is going to be dead soon. And uh, he's uh, dying of cancer. And uh, the guy looked at me, he said, what are you saying? And I said, well, I'm very close to Jesus. And your younger brother has become a Christian uh, in recent years. Apparently, there's been a fallout uh, with you and you don't talk to him. Uh, your mother, uh, your younger brother has asked your mother to reach out to you and uh, tell you and pass a message on uh, that uh, he's dying. He just wants to have one final conversation with you and say goodbye. Uh, but your mother says that uh, you're strict about it and don't want uh, 
he doesn't, you, you don't want him contacting you. And your mother is stuck. She's a Christian woman, as you know, and uh, she's just been praying for something to happen for you to get in touch and ask about your brother. And um, she's bound by uh, loyalty to you. And uh, she's sad for your younger brother because he really wants to make the peace. And he says, are you kidding me? And I said, well, your younger brother looks like this. And I described what he looks like. And, and uh, said a couple of character traits about the younger brother. And so he was sure. And um, he said, um, this is pre-mobile phones, pre-cell phones. And uh, so he said when he gets home, he'll bring his mother and get in touch. And thank you so much. And towards the end of the trip, he filled up with tears. He said, are you serious about this? I said, it's serious. You, you got enough time, you know. That's why you got in my taxi, because... Uh, I heard your mother's prayer. Uh, Jesus has told me to give you the message. And, hey, listen, y your brother's a Christian. He he knows that he's going to meet Jesus. He's going to have a wonderful afterlife. The only thing he wants to do is look you in the face and say sorry and say goodbye. And then tears started rolling down this guy's face. <laughs> and um, see, it was healed. Whatever was between them was healed in that moment. And now... Uh, the brother was um, regretting uh, this fallout and uh, it makes me cry because <laughs> it was very emotional. And, um, you know, I didn't know that that was a word of knowledge and the word of wisdom was uh, for him to get in touch with his brother uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the stuff about the mother was like prophetic. I didn't know I was moving in a prophetic gift. I just knew Jesus was telling me all of this and I've been talking with Jesus for years. But uh, you can see that a very targeted, specific, time-sensitive word of knowledge can bring healing. And uh, so uh, that's uh, one of my favourite stories. Um, so uh, 27 years ago, my second story, uh, 27 years ago, uh, there was... Uh, a word of wisdom, which is like a directional word. Uh, it's like uh, wisdom, my own wisdom, but you could say it's like the spirit of wisdom of the seven spirits of God, or you could say that's the prophetic word of wisdom, uh, like a directional word of God in the prophetic gifts. But I was driving home at night with uh, this uh, partner of a law firm. I was asking him how his law firm was. I knew a bit about law firms because my wife had uh, taken me to court and I dealt with law firms and uh, I'd watched TV with law firms and I'd had a few lawyers in and asked a lot of lawyers about questions. So I understood quite a bit about the workings of law firms. This was a partner and uh, this law firm was the second most popular law firm in Brisbane. It was, you know, if... If you go into court and this law firm was involved in your opposition, you'd have reason to be scared if you weren't with the top law firm in Brisbane. The reason I knew uh, the, the top uh, five law firms is I'd written a couple of screenplays, a couple of movies uh, with uh, lawyers in law firms and barristers in law firms. And uh, so my lead character was a barrister in two of my films. So... Uh, never got uh, released as a film, but I wrote them. So I knew a little bit about law. And uh, and this guy was talking and asking all sorts of questions. He's saying that um, uh, his law firm might go into a receivership uh, because uh, they just have got a problem with the, the uh, bills and the budgeting for the staff and the cash flow. It was mainly the cash flow that was coming through who's saying that the lawyers weren't taking partial payments and progress payments in the cases. So there's a lot of lawyers and staff and law, law uh, servants and law secretaries and stuff doing huge amounts of work in, in cases, but they weren't getting uh, $50,000 or $100,000 a month in fees getting paid. They were, they, they were being slack and they weren't, uh, you know, pressuring the clients to... Uh, pay pay as they go sort of thing and 
you know, a lot of clients will just pain at the end. Of course, when they lose, they don't like to pay. And, uh, and this lawyer was beside himself, this partner of this firm, senior partner of this firm, which means he's a co-owner of the firm. He was beside himself because it, it was his dream. He'd been in law for 20 years and he was working a lot of hours and lawyers worked a lot of hours. He was beside himself. And um, I said, uh, you know, I've got a solution for that if you want to hear it. And uh, he said, what do you mean? I said, uh, I'm close to Jesus and I, I sense he's give me a solution to your problem. And I, I said, do you know those uh, time and motion people that study time and motion and do best work practices and come into a firm and see all the problems and the issues and uh, come in and make decisions on a firm? And I said, yeah. I said, my cousin works in one of them, but uh, even McDonald's, uh, a great corporation, has time and motion people come in and do studies on, on their franchises and improve even the McDonald's system. So uh, everyone can do it. I, I don't know how much they charge an hour, $2,000 an hour or whatever, but you could have a couple of those people come in from uh, uh, the most well-reputed time and motion uh, uh, firm in, in Brisbane or fly one from Sydney. And uh, you can just do an internal email uh, into uh, to your firm and saying, um, we're going to restructure, we're going to do things a new way, uh, we're going to make our firm a lot more profitable. Uh, we seem to be hemorrhaging a bit of money and uh, we're going to stop that. And so we're getting such and such uh, people in from time and motion, uh, law uh, firm and, uh, and best practices firm and, uh, and they're going to lay out some rules. And whatever they say, their recommendations that we pay them to find. Uh, you're going to have to do or you'll lose your job. We'll, we'll actually bring it into a new uh, contract. So we'll have everyone sign new contracts agreeing that they'll abide by what the time and motion people say. And if you don't abide by what they say, uh, you'll lose your job. Your, your job uh, will uh, be lost because this is a new direction we're taking. I said, and when the time and motion people come in, let them have a look at your firm. They'll come up with this same thing that you're struggling with, but certainly tell them that you're struggling with this and have them say to your people, this is how it goes. Everyone's got to take partial payments. Everyone's got to take deposits. Everyone's got to do this or, or, or you, you, you won't be employed. And uh, the guy started crying. He, he, he just lost it and he just started crying. And, uh, you, you, you know, once again, I'm almost going to tears. You, you see grief come out. Uh, you know. So he's just, he said, what are you doing driving a taxi? He said, how did you come out of that? And I said, oh, I know a little bit of law. I know about time and motion. But mostly I know Jesus. And he told uh, me to tell you this. And uh, it's easy for me to think of, but harder for you because you're down under it. I said, if, if, if I hear him correctly, you and your partners are really beautiful management and everyone loves you and you've got a great staff culture and everyone loves you. The problem is you're too intimate with them and you're too close with your staff and they won't listen to you. You're too nice. And um, so you need these guys to come in and be tough and uh, be tough for you. And um, he, he's just crying. He wiped me his tears and he said, thank you so much. And, he says, can I give you a big tip? And I said, no, you haven't got enough money, man. You, you just uh, keep your money and uh, have a good day. And uh, he was so happy, he just wanted to talk. And, you know, if, if we were standing outside the taxi, he, he would have grabbed me and given me a hug. And I know that he wanted to give me a hug. And uh, this was pretty amazing. Uh, this is why it's in these group of testimonies, because it's like one of my best stories. So. That was word of knowledge that the Lord told me about his firm. Uh, that was word of wisdom with directional word, how to handle the problem, what the specific things to do. So word of knowledge can bring out the problem and then you need to move in word of wisdom, which is have the direction to solve the problem. And uh, so I hope you enjoyed.
that story. There's another one coming up just like this. Uh, that guy, uh, uh, if you know Brisbane, he, he went from Brisbane City to the uh, uh, suburb of Hamilton, uh, which is, uh, uh, if you're in Brisbane, near the Breakfast Creek Hotel, which uh, make good steaks and uh, make good seafood there. Uh, in, in in that sort of restaurants around that area, and I went to seafood there and steaks there one time. So it's a special time. Now there's another person who got in a cab in the city of Brisbane and went out to Albion uh, near the airport. And um, we're on this. Took about 18, 20 minutes to get there. We're on this uh, drive out of the city, and I said, "What do you do?" And he says, "I I um, solve people's problems." I said, "How so?" And he said, I said, uh, he says, I, I sort of come in before a law case. I, I do sort of mediation uh, between the fighting people uh, to see if I can uh, solve the problem uh, before it goes to court because then it costs a fortune in court. And I said, what's your case today? What are you doing today? He said, there was this family that was a mother and father started a company and another mother and father started a company and had this, um, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, furniture business. They, they manufactured furniture, got furniture manufactured and uh, uh, used to manufacture furniture. And now they're a wholesaler. They, they wholesale and sell in retail place and wholesale uh, to other shops, uh, you know, this furniture. I said, what's the issue? And he said, well, both the mothers and fathers have retired and one family has um, got two sons and one family's got one son. And the business is 50-50, but the one with a uh, family with two sons, they're both working and there's only one son working from the other family. And the ones with two sons are saying they should get two thirds of the profits. And... Um, the one with one son should get one. I said, are they all getting salaries out of the business? Are they getting paid salaries? And uh, he said, yeah. And I said, well, that's that's what they're getting paid to do their job. The profits are the profits. The, the profits started from the families. I said, so here's my solution for that. And he said, what do you mean your solution? I said, well, I, I speak to uh, Jesus, uh, the spirit of uh, Holy Spirit through Jesus, give me counsel to share with you as something to start with in the negotiations today. He said, okay, I'm interested. And I said, well, the mother and the fathers built this. They're 50% partners. So go in today and say to the boys with the two sons and the one with the one sons, let's get the profits over the last two years, the average monthly profit over the last two years. Just get a medium profit for each month, or uh, so. So, you know, you've got this average, this mean profit, and say anything up to today's profit goes 50 50, right? But any profits above these medium profits for the last two years, over the next year, if profits go up substantially, uh, two thirds of the profits go to the sun of two thirds. And one third goes to the son with one son. But as of today's business, today's profit levels, based over the last 24 months, there's a medium profit over those 24 months. Based on today's profits, the profits are 50-50. And if the two guys can work hard and increase profits uh, substantially, maybe they can get two thirds of the profits of the increase in profits over the coming years. And that means they've done a good job. Um, so you can start there. Now the guy with one son might not think that's fair. So you may say, well, instead of two thirds, uh, let's say uh, 55% or 60%. And um, the guy didn't cry because he wasn't, it wasn't his family, he was a mediator. He said, what are you doing driving taxis, man? And I said, helping people like you. Sometimes people like you need an answer. And I love meeting people and that was easy for me, you know? Because I got an edge, I, I hear from God. 
And uh, so God bless you. And I said, do you think that? He said, that's certainly the starting point. Uh, it's nothing like I had. I, I, I didn't have anything for it. I was going to listen to both sides and do my job. <laughs> you know, that, the, the guys with two sons, you know, they probably like that. And I said, well, it's got nothing to do with the fact they got two. The fact that they're getting two salaries means they're getting what they're worth as a salary. So they shouldn't be getting two thirds of profit. It should always be 50%. That's what the family's built, right? It's, it's corrupt, it's evil, you know? Uh, what doesn't uh, the other son put uh, his wife on the team or his girlfriend on the team and have two each and then uh, give his wife a salary and then take it back to 50%. I said, if that's how the son wanted to solve it, that's how he could solve it. He could bring in a girlfriend um, to be his other worker, and uh, then it's between 2 2 and 50%. He says, that's another genius idea. And, uh, and I said, well, there you go. There's some ideas for you, man. So that's a word of uh, wisdom, that's a directional word. That's, like the spirit of counsel and understanding and word of wisdom, spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel uh, operating there. And um, of course, if you had that encounter, that might be one of your favorites too. Um, this uh, um, had a couple of girls uh, from the suburb called uh, Yeronga in Brisbane, South of Brisbane. They were traveling in the city and they were talking away and I shared a couple of things about one of the girls. She was impressed with a couple of words of knowledge about a character. I shared a couple of character traits about the other girl. There's a blonde and brunette, they're both really pretty and, uh, and uh, you know, they're a good uh, team to go out to bars together because one's a blonde, one's a brunette. They're both stunning so, you know, it depends if the guy likes blondes or brunettes, you know, they'd be good together. I was thinking that in the car. So they have a good chat and telling them about themselves and stuff. They're really impressed with my ability to uh, tell them and see them supernaturally. They're impressed with me. And uh, then I got to a stage that I knew that Jesus was telling me they are so impressed. I said to him, which I went to a new level 27 years ago when I said this, said, have you got any answers? Because I can talk to Jesus. Have you got any questions that you want to ask Jesus? One of them, uh, normally I do this sometimes. Uh, one of them dipped their foot in the water and asked a question. It was a pretty simple question and the answer came back and really impressed her. Then she asked, is, is, my, um, is my grandmother in heaven? Uh, I said, what's her name? And she said, Judy. And uh, I said, uh, She's a really devout Catholic, wasn't she? And uh, she said, yeah. And she said, of course, your grandmother, Judy's in heaven. She says, um, she says, and this is like moving into mediumship, but the saints of heaven are alive and, and, and we can do these things. I, I don't do it by request. I don't have it on my prophetic website, but I, I do do it when Jesus allows it. And uh, her, her mother, Judy, said something to uh, her grandmother, Judy, said something to her that I had her crying. And uh, so I knew it was authentic. I think that was one of the first times I've ever done that before. And I was told by the Holy Spirit to ask her, uh, have you got any questions? And I've done it three times. And three times that I remember, and three times the second question has been about a relative. And so I can see why mediums are in the business of doing that, contacting relatives, because a lot of people want to know these things. Interesting enough, I've never been asked by the Holy Spirit to ask a person if they have any questions for Jesus and had them ask about a relative that's in hell. Uh, you know, rarely, probably one in a thousand encounters do I ask people if they've got any questions. Well, no, maybe... Maybe one in a hundred encounters, I ask people if they got any questions for Jesus, and um, none of them have ever asked about a relative that didn't go to heaven. So 
because the Holy Spirit directs what I do, um, uh, you know, he knows not to have me ask that question uh, with people whose relatives are obviously in hell. That would really upset the person. And uh, so um, that's taking it to a new level. And when you have a good encounter and a person really enjoys talking to you, and really there's some like glue that won't have your part. Uh, and if you had 20 of my T-shirts, you'd find that glue happening. Um, and uh, I'm not trying to sell my T-shirts, but I want to get 50 of my T-shirts. My anointing is so powerful now with 20. <laughs> Can't imagine the glory I'll be walking in when I got 50. So um, so that was very interesting. They had a really interesting ride and they really enjoyed themselves. I think if I had I had business cards in those days, those girls may have followed me up and uh, you know, rang me up and invited me for drinks one time. So, once again, these are all taxi trips. Uh, 27 years ago, I was, I was at night time. It's like about three in the morning. I was on a night shift. There was um, about 15 taxis all in a row outside these nightclubs. And these uh, couple of young, pretty girls, about 20 years of age, walked up to my taxi, which was towards the end of this line. And they jumped in, they said, we thought we'd pick your taxi today. And said, oh, you walk past all the ones in front. Because normally the one in front gets the first job. Rarely do people walk past all the taxis and come up uh, to the 15th taxi. But, you know, it's a rule among taxis. If someone wants to get in your taxi, you, you let them in. You know, the other taxi drivers don't mind. And so um, they got in and, uh, at least this, there was a girl in the front seat and she's talking to the girl in the back seat. The girl in the back seat was blonde. The girl in the front seat was brunette at those times. I really liked brunettes. And I think I was about uh, 28 then and she was about 20. So she was very attractive to me. At that time, my wife was about uh, 22. So uh, so um, it was very uh, attractive to me. Uh, you know, but girls have always been attractive if you're watching this series. I, I love girls. And uh, so she's talking to a friend all the way and we dropped a friend off somewhere uh, about 20 minutes away from the city. And as we pulled away from her friend's place, Jesus spoke to me. He was speaking to me while she was speaking to her friends. I said, you know, everything you said to your friend just then was a whole lot of garbage. You know, you're just speaking a whole lot of garbage. And she said, what are, you, what are you saying? And I said, well, actually, this girl was in the back. A friend was in the front. And, and I said, well, now, you, you, you gave your friend uh, this idea that you're all happy and life's good and everything's going well and you're laughing and saying jokes. So, but life isn't well. Life isn't funny. Life isn't happy for you. Actually, when you go home, unless I have a proper talk to you, you're going to take a whole lot of pills and suicide and kill yourself. And she said, how do you know that? And I said, oh, I'm good friends with Jesus. And he's telling me the reason why you passed all those taxis is uh, if, if, if you got into 14 taxis before, they wouldn't have known what you're going to do. But I know what you're going to do. The reason you and your friend picked this taxi was that Jesus wanted to save your life. She started crying. She said, how do you know this? I said, because Jesus, whether you believe in him or not, he doesn't want you to suicide tonight. He doesn't want you to take those. And, and you know, I know that you can, and I, I know that if I don't have a good talk to you, you will. But what put, brings you to this position, because I've been there with myself, uh, feeling suicidal, what brings you to this point? And uh, we got to a place, and... Uh, she paid the money and I turned off the meter. I said, you don't have to get out. We can just talk. It doesn't matter if the meter's, uh, if the meter's not running. And we talked for another 20 minutes. And her young boyfriend had broken up with her that night. Uh, she asked if she could just be friends with him. And he said he didn't even want to be friends. He just wants to make a clean break and not see her anymore. And she was just completely devastated and broken hearted. It was her first love. And 
She'd been with him for two years. She'd been sleeping with him. She was one flesh with him. She, you know, her whole world revolved around him. And uh, it, she just had a broken heart. She just didn't want to live. And, you know, that causes suicide. So once again, very big encounter. This girl wouldn't be living. Well, you know, a lot of people that suicide with pills don't actually succeed. Uh, I don't know about the people that do succeed. I've only heard stories of the people who didn't. But um, I was there to save a life that night. And uh, so that's one of my memorable encounters. Well, I got baptised with the Holy Spirit uh, years later after my wife had left me. And uh, about 20 years ago, when I moved in Sydney about 19 years ago, I was uh, walking through the streets of Sydney by myself. I think I was walking back from a bar. I knew some people in the bar. I used to drink at, at this bar with some people. Jesus said, go to McDonald's. Uh, and um, and uh, there's a girl on the second level. There was two levels in the McDonald's. Go into the McDonald's, there's a girl on the second level with uh, black uh, pants on and a red top. She's got brunette hair, she's about 22. Uh, went into McDonald's on the second level. There was a girl in a red top, she had black hair and uh, she had uh, black pants on. And uh, uh, you know, you can get in trouble in McDonald's in Sydney if you, uh, you know, just go in and you're not a customer and you just start talking to people. So I went up and got myself a super sauce coke, which is about this big, huge, used to be $2.50 back then and had uh, about a litre of coke in it. <laughs> so I bought myself one of them and uh, went and sat in the table next to us. She's reading a newspaper, a Sydney newspaper called the Daily Telegraph. So he's flicking through that and I, I said to her, I'm pretty used to starting conversations with strangers and I said, is there any good news in the paper? And she said, not really, not much good news. I said, uh, papers are full of bad news to, to make us feel better, you know. So if it's full of bad news, it's probably making you feel a little bit better. Uh, uh, when I was up at, I uh, always forget this when I'm telling this story. Some of my friends have heard this story. I always forget this and I get to this stage and then I go back. So back when I, I was buying the, tack, uh, the Coke, I said to Jesus, why am I here? Uh, can you give me a clue? What do you want me to say to this girl? And uh, Jesus said, her mother's dying of cancer uh, and uh, you need to give her some answers for me because the mother's going to die. And uh, I said, okay. So I sat down and I said, uh, how's your mother go? And she, she looked at me. She said, do I know you from somewhere? I said, no. And then a vision started in my mind, a scene in my mind, like a movie reel started. I said, no, you don't know me, but last night you kneeled beside your bed like you've learned as a child. Uh, your mother's dying of cancer and... Uh, and you kneel beside your bed and you said, Jesus, if you don't answer me why my mother's dying and help me with this, I'm never going to go to church. I'm never going to speak to you again. So you need to give me answers. And uh, you said that last night. And uh, because Jesus can't be here in the flesh, he sent me in to answer your questions. Uh, so what are your questions? And uh, she was just had eyes like this and then started crying. And she said, how am I going to cope without my mum? And then I went into my life. I went into the fact that when we suffer, it draws us closer to Jesus. And went into the fact that you know, her mother's tired and she, she wants to die. And she, she's only been holding on these couple of weeks because you can't accept that she's going. And she's been praying furiously for you that you'll come to grips with the fact that she's dying and just let her go. And then she said, you know, there's a song. All of these <laughs> get me emotional. There's a song uh, in a movie, How Can I Live Without You? Um, and uh, and uh, she, she said, how, how can I live without my mum? And, and how can I live without her? And, 
And I said, it must be hard, but it's going to bring you a lot closer to Jesus. And you've got a good relationship with Jesus. And you can hear him and you can talk to him. And it's going to bring you so much closer. And your mother's going to a really beautiful place. You know, your mum's really looking forward to being there. She's sick of suffering. And, you know, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding or what your mind is saying. In all of your ways, praise God and he will make your path straight. It's a verse out of the Bible and I hope that it encourages you. She asked a few more questions and thanked me and uh, left. That was uh, really, really one of my, one of my favourite uh, encounters. Uh, my first one in Sydney. And uh, it was really profound at that time. When I first came to Sydney, I went into a bar and I met some people in the bar and I had about four friends in this bar I could drink in. And, um, and, and so I used to do that and I started to develop Christian friends at McDonald's, I used to meet at McDonald's at night. So I used to spend a lot of times at McDonald's and another night 20 years ago I was, um, walking through the city and Jesus said, go to McDonald's. And so I went to McDonald's and I said, who do you want me to see? Cause he's in this habit of getting directed. Jesus said, there's no one here. Uh, I want you to go to King's Cross McDonald's and uh, there's someone up there that I want you to meet. And I said, Jesus, King's Cross McDonald's is like, way up there and I've got to catch a train, it's 11.30. By the time I catch a train and go to McDonald's up there, it'll be like, you know, five to 12. Then I'll have to walk home to the city, you know, like, can't you get someone else? And he says, uh, you're the only one I can send, Matthew. You know, I need you. I said, I really don't want to go. He said, well, Matthew, What's a walk back into the city? You're going to enjoy it. It's a nice night. You've done it before. You've done it drunk. You've done it sober. You've done it when you've been out for drinks. Please do it for me today. I need you today. So I caught a train up there and on the way to McDonald's. And there's a uh, homeless, uh, well, I don't know if he had a house, but he was a pretty radical guy that used to go to a church. Or, was going to and I knew him from King's Cross. King's Cross was our like red light district of, of Sydney, like Las Vegas is to America. All street walking prostitutes line themselves up there. Young girls uh, uh, find their way to the cross and start selling themselves on the streets there. I was walking to McDonald's, there was this uh, street guy that I knew that used to carry a big boom box around and he had that on his shoulder and he's singing uh, some, uh, you know, rock song at the top of his lungs and he's just playing the music flat out and singing to himself and singing to anyone who's watching. There's a young girl about uh, 20 uh, there uh, standing, a street walker, you know, like mini skirt and a nice top on. And she's watching and she's smiling and I walked up to her and I said, uh, he's really funny, his name's uh, Radio John and he's... Um, He's a regular here. Everyone knows who he is. Everyone likes him. He's funny, isn't he? And she said, yeah. And I said, uh, you must be new here. Is this your first night? And she said, yeah. And I said, um, what put you in this uh, condition that uh, you have to come up here and sell yourself? And uh, she said, I, I've just got some bills uh, I've got to pay. And I said, uh, how, much, how much do you have to earn tonight uh, from sleeping with guys? How much? do you need for your bills? And she said, a hundred dollars. And I said, come for a coffee down the street here. I'll give you a hundred dollars. We'll have a coffee. And then um, if you're happy with the hundred dollars and the chat, uh, I'll just walk you back into the city. And uh, can you get a night ride at home and buses that go all night? And she said, yeah. I said, let's do that. She said, why are you doing this? And I said, well, you'd be interested. Jesus sent me from the city. He said that uh, you were praying. Uh, and you must have been praying pretty hard because 
he brought me all the way from the city and I argued with him and uh, he said he had no one else. So he told me to come up here and rescue you. And, uh, she uh, had tears start coming out of her eyes. And, uh, nearly all of these are the tears or uh, stories. We went up and had a coffee and uh, she, she said, um, do you want to have sex with me for the hundred dollars? I said, no, of course not. I'm sort of privileged to be saving you. And, uh, and uh, here's my phone number. If you're ever in trouble again, oh, and actually I didn't give her my phone number. And um, so we had a coffee, she had a hot chocolate and we walked back into the city. I put her in a bus and the bus pulled out. She was going home. So she had a hundred dollars. Well, I had a hundred dollars on me. So that was, you know, I think I could go to a hole in the war bank and got a hundred dollars for it. Gave it to her, paid for the coffee and sent her home. Um, about three weeks later, I was up in King's Cross. I spent a lot of time in King's Cross at those days. And uh, here she was again. And I said, how much do you need tonight? And uh, she said $300. And I said, oh, you know, probably only can give you 50. Um, I'll just have to pray that you get $300. And it's the easiest way you can get it. And I saw her about an hour later and she said a guy uh, took me to the rented room and just wanted to talk to me for an hour and he gave me $300. So thank you so much for your prayer. This is the second time you rescued me. And over the years, I saw her coming in the cross a lot and uh, we call it the cross here. And I met a boyfriend who was pimping her and he used to be her security and uh, they both ended up having heroin habits and uh, was shooting it up their arm. So she became a regular fixture of King's Cross. And one day she actually came up to me and gave me the hundred dollars back. And uh, I said, she didn't have to. And she said, I want to. And uh, we become good friends. And that's being Jesus to a person. You know, that's the, it's a really uh, beautiful uh, thing that the boyfriend loved me, uh, you know, and uh, me and him had coffee together and, we got to know each other. He knew that I'd never slept with his girlfriend, that, that I'd never taken advantage, I'd never been a client, I'd only been like a father figure to her, and he really loved me, you know, he, he loved me. And um, a lot of the girls go into brothels there and get controlled by other men, uh, but she was never controlled by anyone, and uh, her boyfriend always looked out for her. And um, it's very special, you know, uh, one day uh, I'm going to become popular in the world and hope that she can see me one day and say, hey, there's a guy who who I know. And uh, So there's enough of one, hey? There's another one of my encounters. Um, about 10 years ago, I'm just going from a list here. About 10 years ago, um, I, I was meant to meet a friend uh, in Burwood, in the suburb, which is a bus right away from me. Um, and before, 10 years ago, I didn't know you could catch a bus from my street up there. So I used to catch a train up there. It was one station away. And 10 years ago, I was standing outside what you call a Burger King. In Australia, we call them Hungry Jacks uh, because someone had a, a business named Burger King here in Australia, so they couldn't uh, operate under that name. But here in Australia, uh, it's called Hungry Jacks, and I'm standing outside of Hungry Jacks, and I was meant to meet this friend there, and he's running late. I was looking into the Hungry Jacks, and this is the first time. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, I would have been, uh, I would have been operating in the prophetic um, since, uh, say, 90, about 92, so 10 years ago would have been, um, 10 years ago would have been 2009. So it was, um, nine and eight, about 17 years. So I was in the office of profit then. And uh, so some of these stories I'm going to share when you've got a new prophetic gift, you shouldn't be operating and doing this. This is something where you've got to be 
really accurate and uh, really flowing in your prophetic gift. A lot of people who teach the prophetic uh, share that this is dangerous doing this. But uh, I'm a, you know, a prophet in my office and uh, I've got a lot of authority, a lot of experience. So I just put that out as a general warning for you. Uh, when you're new to the prophetic, you probably don't want to do this, but this is my favourite prophetic encounters, uh, doing this sort of stuff. So 10 years ago, I was outside this Burger King waiting. This guy said he'd be 15 minutes. He was picking me up in the car. I saw this couple in the Burger King with their arms around each other, uh, looking in each other's eyes and kissing each other. And Jesus said to me, it's the very first time that this had ever happened. Jesus said, this boy and girl are meant to be married. They, they were born for each other. And um, I'd lost my wife and for years had been missing her for 15 years. And it was very special. They were young in the early 20s or teenagers. And uh, I know that she was about 22 and they were about 22, 24. And... Uh, it's very special to me. Love is so special. And the fact that Jesus had told me they were born to be married was so special. And so I was watching them uh, romantically look into each other's eyes and hold each other in public, which was so romantic. Jesus said, go and tell them. I said, what? Go and tell them that they're meant to be together, especially the guy. Go and tell the guy that she's... Uh, She's the one for him. And so I was a bit nervous, but I went in and they said, excuse me, I've got a gift. And from time to time, I get a message for a person. That used to be my introduction line. And I said, today, I've got a message for you too. And when you approach people with that line, they think you're a clairvoyant or a psychic, they're going to get a free reading. So people aren't objectionable to it in Australia, at least. And... Um, <coughs> I said, uh, you know, I'm a friend of Jesus and he tells me that you were born to be together. And uh, that uh, started talking to the guy. I said, this girl wants to marry you, man. And uh, she's decided you're the one for her. And uh, she doesn't even look at other guys. She's not interested in any other guy. She just wants you. And she's just waiting for you to ask her to marry you. Know marry her and you know I understand mate there's pressure there's divorce there's a lot of risk it's a lot of commitment to get married and I can understand if you're nervous but she's gonna wait she she, she wants you and she's gonna wait for you and he looked at her and he said is this true Alan and she said yeah I said I'll tell you more I'm gonna tell him one of your secrets now she's even been going looking through those wedding magazines and she's even been looking at what dress she wants to wear in the wedding and he looked at her again and says is that true and she said yeah that's true how do you know that man and i said oh, i just i'm pretty good at this uh, telling things i said so there's your proof man she's already looking at the dresses she wants you and uh, take your time and uh, marriage doesn't have to be ten or twenty thousand dollars you can just have a civil wedding and in a church and you can just go to a restaurant with 10 or 20 of your friends. It doesn't have to be $20,000. You don't even have to tell the restaurant it's a wedding. You can just go there with 10 or 20 of your friends. You can book a room in a restaurant. So you want uh, an a la carte menu and uh, just like the restaurant downstairs, but uh, you want to have a group of 20 in it. Just a special occasion. Uh, you mentioned the word marriage and the times everything by five. And uh, he's smiling. He said, thanks, man. And he said, what What made you come and tell us? And I said, oh, Jesus, I was outside and waiting for a friend. I've got to go now. But um, Jesus told me to come and tell you because he just knew that you just needed a bit of confirmation. You needed to hear it from someone else. Total stranger. And the girl is just... The girl's just smiling like, have you ever seen the ads on TV where girls are advertising uh, their teeth like toothpaste? 
you know how they smile, these models smile. Or, yeah, she was just beaming. <laughs> and uh, it really makes the girls happy when you do these sort of prophecies. So I want to share with you, um, be careful if you're new to the prophetic. This, this can totally ruin a person's life if you're wrong. Um, so but uh, I've done, there's a time where I was doing 10 to 20 of these prophetic words a day. Um, but um, last week, we're skipping from 10 years to last week, I was in my shopping centre. I, um, I go out in these T-shirts. I've got uh, 20 of these T-shirts now, 20 different designs. And uh, they're my uniform. And uh, last week, uh, I made them to 5XL so they fit me. And uh, you have to be pretty big for 5XL not to fit you. And... Uh, so I was in my favourite shopping centre and since my mother died 15 weeks ago, she's come up with this term that when I go out, I'm weaponised. And, you know, a lot of Air Force uh, jets, fighter, fighter jets, can uh, be empty of bombs, but when they come back to the ship, when they come back to the Air Force base, they, they get loaded up with all their bombs and they become weaponised. And my mother said, every time I go out, I'm weaponized. And, uh, and that's what I am. And then whenever I go out, I give three or four prophetic words. And uh, so this time I was weaponized. I was walking through this uh, 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 shopping center and uh, seen this uh, really attractive girl, a really handsome young guy. They're both are about 25. And I said, hey, buddy. And said, yeah. I said, no. Uh, this girl that you're with is not only extraordinarily beautiful and she knows how to um, she she knows how to dress but um she um she she loves you in so many extraordinary ways that she keeps on coming up with um that uh, you remember she keeps on coming up with different characteristics in your personality that she likes. She's always saying, oh, I like this about you, I like this about you, and she's smiling. And she says, how do you know that? I said, oh, I've got like a psychic gift, but I'm a prophet, I hear from God. And he, uh, he's telling me this, and I'll tell you something else. And, and he said, what? I said, this girl, she's just waiting for you to ask her to marry her. She she loves you so much. You're the only one for her. She she doesn't even see other guys. She just other guys don't even turn her head. And because uh, she's so extraordinarily pretty, uh, you might wonder about that. But nothing turns her head like you. She there's so many dimensions of you that she loves. And he looked at her. And she's nodding her head. I said, in, in fact, she loves you so much. Her and her girlfriends have looked through wedding uh, magazines and looked at wedding dresses. And she's sort of got a good idea of what sort of wedding dress she's gonna, she's even got an idea of the one if, if uh, you were to pop that question. And look, he said, I, is that right, honey? And she said, yeah, yeah, I could show you the dress. And uh, he was just overcome and she was just beaming. The girls always beam. I said, man, I just want to tell you, you know, I'm a very close friend of Jesus and Jesus really loves you, man. You're just uh, such a creative, beautiful, kind, compassionate, loving, intelligent, out of the box, maverick. And uh, you just excel in so many dimensions. And she just loves everything about you. And you take your time, make it a year, two years. Whatever it takes, just take your time. She isn't going anywhere. She, she'll wait. She, she just wants you. And she's been telling you in subtle ways. But, um, you know, maybe she'd just even been praying that a stranger like me would walk up and encourage you. And he said, thank you so much, man. And I said, God bless you both. And, uh, if you've got any questions, Here's the card. I've designed 200 T-shirts, like the T-shirt I've got on now. 
if you ever got any questions about anything, give me a call. And, uh, gave it to her, they took the card and that was just so beautiful. I love that. It's my uh, one of my favourite forms of prophecy these days that the Lord has released me into it is these couples prophecies. So uh, Uh, so today I was in this shopping centre. That, that was uh, last week. Today I was in the same shopping centre. Um, going up an escalator, uh, I felt led by the Holy Spirit to go down into uh, cinema to see what movies were on. There were no movies on that I liked. I asked a girl about uh, a movie called Queen's Corgi and she said it's about the the type of dog of the queen. I said, is the queen in the movie? And she said, no, just it's about the dog. I said, I said it's like a documentary about the dogs. Yeah, I said, oh, well. But anyway, I said, mate, I said, I just want you to know, you're a really beautiful girl. You know, you're really, uh, you're really good at service. You're very compassionate. You're very loving. You put your whole self into your job. An extraordinary worker really encouraging to people you meet, you really love people, just really good at your job and God really loves you. And uh, she said, thank you so much. And so I had my reason why I'd gone down there now. And uh, there's always different girls serving at the cinemas. As I was going up the escalator, I mean, those things are going like that. Uh, there's a girl got on, it was really pretty and with a boyfriend and, uh, um, I said to uh, her, have you been to see a movie? And I said, no, we're just going shopping. I said, uh, and uh, as we got up the top, I said, um, you, you, you're extraordinarily pretty. Uh, and you certainly know how to dress. It's just a beautiful uh, pantsuit that you've got on. It just looks beautiful on you. And she said, thank you so much. And I said, you know, yeah, um, I looked at the guy and she, she sort of gave him a look like, like this at him and uh, I, I said, hold on there. And I put my arm around the guy and said, hey, listen, when we've got a girlfriend like this, we get a bit complacent, you know. Yeah, you're just so used to her looking pretty all the time. You you probably don't co comment on how pretty she is and how, how she looks nice. And, and I looked at the girl and I said, it's not his fault, we just... We just become complacent and I'm like the age of your father. So this isn't any sort of win on line to you, but you know, don't be hard on me, but just on behalf of uh, females out there and behalf of males out there, you're really beautiful. And, and I said to the guy, I took my arm, I went around and I said, can I tell you something about her? Um, uh, and he said, yeah. And, uh, I said, uh, you're the only one for her. She's only got eyes for you. She's not interested in any other guy. And she'll wait, whether it's a year or two. She doesn't mind how long it takes. She, she, she's only waiting for her proposal. She's waiting to marry you. And he looked at her and she smiled. They, they always beam the girls. And I said, she's, she, her and her girlfriend's always already looking through the magazines, looking at dresses. Just picking, oh, that's nice, that's nice. It's one of the things her and her girlfriends do. They just get one of those monthly magazines and, you know, reminisce and have a look at them. And wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? Hey, looked at her. The guys always got that question. Are you serious? Do, do you do that? She said, yeah. I said, you, you find that she could take you to a magazine already and point to her dress and say, I want that one. What do you think? And he looked at her, he said, are you serious? And she said, yeah, I can do that. And I said, sorry for giving up all your secrets, but sometimes the men need a bit of encouragement. And she was uh, so happy. And so God bless you both. And I wish I could be at your wedding. And, uh, 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 so uh, then uh, I went to an appointment. Uh, uh, we're, we're meeting someone in the city tonight and teaching a class on the prophetic. And uh, 
on the way in, there's a guy that walked in with like a billboard on himself. And there was a guy chatting to him who'd known him from 10 years ago when he used to walk around with a billboard 10 years ago. And he's having a really good uh, chat to uh, this guy, being really encouraging. I can tell he's very observant and not rejecting this guy and uh, not making this guy think he's crazy, but treating the guy as a bit of a hero. And um, I got his attention, the guy that was talking to the guy with the billboard, and I said, told uh, him uh, some of his character traits. And uh, I said to him that uh, he's, he's not judgmental, he doesn't judge anyone. Um, that he treats uh, a millionaire or someone in a $10,000 Armani suit the same as he treats a homeless person. In fact, he probably treat a poor or homeless person with more dignity than, than someone in a Armani suit. And he's very compassionate, he's very kind, uh, he's very giving, he's very free with his money, sharing his money, helping people out that need a, a hand. He's got a heart for justice, he's got a heart of compassion, a heart for justice. And he, he knows some things are going wrong with the world and he knows the people that are doing the wrong things in the world. And he knows a lot of people are suffering and he, he knows so much that it makes him sad and he needs to push this away in his mind and put it in another place because if he thought about those things all the time, it'd just wreck him. And uh, I said, I'm very close to Jesus. I'm very close to God. And uh, God really loves you, mate, and uh, really loves who you are. And uh, I encourage you to uh, check Jesus out. And uh, But uh, Jesus wants you to know that he really loves you, man. And uh, he was so thankful. And he started talking to the other guy again. And as he got off the train, he waved at me. He said, thanks for what you said. It made my day. And uh, I got off the train and... Uh, there's a girl walking towards me. She smiled at my T-shirt. And uh, I said, yeah, you not only got a beautiful smile, that's a really wonderful dress you've got on, really beautiful. She said, thank you so much. You made my day. That's another thing. Besides tears, uh, if you hear from someone, you made my day, that's really big. People say that when they're really happy and they're really felt uh, really beautifully complimented. So there's some stories, there's some testimonies. So I estimate I've done about uh, between 10 and 20,000 prophetic words with strangers. So I've become very good at it. And like I shared in another of my teachings, half the people I encounter, I'm just encouraging. I'm telling a girl she's really pretty. I'm telling a girl she looks really nice. I'm telling a guy I love how he looks. I love his boots. I love his tie. I love his shirt. I love his jumper. I love I, I tell workers that they're very efficient. And if I had a restaurant, I'd, I'd poach you. I'd, I'd, I'd steal you. I'm just always encouraging people, always saying genuine, beautiful compliments and building people up. And I just love to do it. Uh, I don't do it uh, to have people say thank you or uh, having people say thank you is a good thing. Um, but I do it because I've learned to be Jesus. Uh, I've learned to be a Jesus that people will remember. And I think it's very important. I think it's very important that we demonstrate Jesus. That uh, Jesus shouldn't be in a textbook. Jesus shouldn't be in a Bible. Jesus should be in us. We should manifest everything that was in Jesus. And we should be a demonstration of his love to people. And uh, I've had a few people who know me say that I'm the most beautiful Jesus-like person I've ever known. I've had people say, I had a friend, Mary Gibson, who says that um, I'm the most profound, knowledgeable, full of wisdom, Jesus-like teacher of the Word of God she's ever seen in, in her life. And she's watched probably hundreds of my videos and she's read 53 of my 55 books. 
and she's had hundreds of hours of conversation with me on the phone. And that's her assessment of who I am. And, and I believe anyone can be who I am. 1 John uh, 2 6 says, Anyone who says he abides in him must walk just as he walked. And I'm just a manifestation of that scripture. I'm just a physical manifestation of that scripture. I was walking up um, this hill one time, and there's a church I used to go to, it's mentioned in my books, so it's street level. And um, I was walking up this hill and I was puffing. Jesus said, you know, you could have never been one of my disciples. And I said, why? He says, we were walking up so many mountains. You wouldn't have made it. Then. You wouldn't have been able to get up the mountains. And it's like, and, and it says, yeah, I can't even make it to church. I don't know, make it up the mountain. And, uh, so Jesus is funny like that. It's one of the times I... <laughs> He made me laugh. One time he rebuked me and got really cranky at me. I was walking home from the station. It's about an eight minute walk. And it started raining. I said, Jesus, can you stop it raining? He said, you Christians, you think you can order the rain around? You think I didn't walk through Palestine and have it rain on me? Do you think I, every time it rained, I, I stopped the rain? Do you think the Israelites walked through uh, the, the wilderness for 40 years and it never rained on them. You, you think you, you think just because you're a Christian you can turn them, the rain on and off? He said, I didn't even have a change of clothes. You know, I, I had to sleep in wet clothes. Uh, you, you'll be home in two minutes. You can have a bar, you can have a shower, change into some fresh clothes and be in a warm bed tonight. I couldn't even guarantee the bed. I couldn't even guarantee I was going to have a bed that night when it was going to rain on me. Who do you think you are telling me to stop it raining? And uh, Jesus has been cranky at me about three or four times in the 30 years that I've known him uh, since I was eight. So that's um, uh, 40, 44 years I've known him. He's been angry three or four times with me. But Jesus has made me laugh that time I was walking up the hill. So you couldn't have been one of my disciples. You can't even walk up the hill to church. Uh, so I hope, uh, I hope that you heard these testimonies, that you saw me get emotional and almost cry. But um, there's real emotion involved in these. And one of the best compliments a person can do is uh, their eyes fill up with, with tears. Uh, when when you prophesy to them, and uh, it's it's a really powerful thing if a stranger can cry in front of you, and uh, so I really hope you've been encouraged. I hope that this is a video that uh, you could uh, feel free to share with your friends and say, "Hey, come and listen to this guy's series on prophetic evangelism. Uh, he's really good." and uh, I encourage you to uh, go down to the description tag where it says see more and check out my website and check out my books. Uh, request a prophecy if you can. Uh, support my ministry, send in some money. Go to the description tag and check out my t-shirt site and uh, buy 10 t-shirts, buy 20 t-shirts and watch the glory of God come onto your life. and. If you're not a friend of mine on Facebook, uh, find the link where you can friend request me under Matthew Robert Payne. And, uh, if you like this video, press thumbs up. If you want to encourage me, write me a comment or write me an email via my email address. And uh, God bless you and keep you. And, uh, and uh, uh, there's also going to be a link to the playlist of these prophetic evangelism and videos. So if this is the only one you've watched, I go into that playlist and watch a whole lot of them. God bless you.